A few months ago, I did a thoughts on video about the Nintendo Switch shortly after the reveal trailer was released. At that point, I was really ecstatic about the device. It could be another great addition to Nintendo's line of consoles while bringing its own innovations to the table. Fast forward to January 13th, 2017, and BAM! Nintendo's presentation for the Switch arrives in my, oh my was it worth the wait. It was one of the best presentations they've had in a long time, and for the most part, I was really happy with the results, and I'm still very eager to try out the device when it launches March 3rd. That said, there was a lot of good the conference gave us, but there was also quite the bit of bad. So for today, I'm going to count down the top 5 best and worst aspects to the Nintendo Switch presentation. I'm going to start with the worst as I do want to end the video off on a positive note, but without further delay, let's get to the countdown. So be Number 5 Worst Okay, for starters, this was probably the joke of the night for many, but dear god, the translator. Oh boy, he just wasn't good. I don't know if it was the same guy throughout the entire presentation, but either way, it was most noticeable for me when Suda51 hit the stage. His diction was weak, with numerous breaks and awkward pauses throughout. He just came off to me like he was really unprepared to transcribe the dialogue. While I hope this post wasn't due to his firing, seriously, I don't think it was that awful because at least it was entertaining. Nintendo's official Twitter account for job listings even posted a tweet listing a job opening for a translator a few days afterwards. Wow. I don't know anything about the business, but from what I've seen, if you want to be a translator, especially for Nintendo, take my advice. Be more like Bill Trinan, and less like this guy. Thank you very much for your time today. It was Grasshopper Suda 51 signing up. Number 4 Worst. Oh boy, I'm calling it right here, right now. 1-2 Switch is not going to sell well. And why is that? Well, here's three reasons. It's $50 at retail, it's not a pack-in game, and it's essentially just a tech demo for the Switch hardware. Plus, it's been compared to Wii's Play rather than Wii Sports, and we all know how mediocre that turned out. I don't want this game to fail, I really do want it to succeed, but Nintendo just hasn't hit the right notes with this game in my opinion. Not to mention, some of the mini-games come off as really awkward. Like, ew. Number 3 Worst what was one of the key aspects of the Switch reveal? Well, portability, of course. The concept of having the power of a home console on a device you can play both at home and on the go is brilliant to me. While demonstrating the Switch at the conference, they decided to focus more on the technical aspects. In all honesty, this is fine as we do need to know how the system operates in general. I'm not sure how they could do this, but I just wish there was more emphasis on the fact that this is a system you can take anywhere you want. I'd rather have more emphasis on that than emphasis on HD rumble. That's for sure. Number 2 Worst The Switch will not feature free online multiplayer, a first for Nintendo. I'm mostly indifferent to paid online memberships for consoles like this. Sometimes I buy them for incentives, like Xbox's occasional join gold for a dollar deal. For the free games you can get, that seems like a pretty good deal. Same goes for PlayStation Plus. You can get free games, although you can only keep the games if you keep the Plus membership. Nintendo decided to take a different approach with the Switch. Instead of giving us multiple games each month that we can keep afterwards, you get one NES or Super Nintendo game. That's it. Not to mention how after each period is over, you can't keep the game. I think giving us a plethora of Nintendo classics each month and letting us keep them afterwards would be an overall much more satisfying move overall. But alas, Nintendo does what Nintendo does. The only real positive about this is the newly added online support to some of these classics. I'm not sure how it'll operate, but it's going to be an interesting feature to see happen. But yeah, the lack of any good incentives for this paid online membership really does hurt the service. And while I know they're not going to abolish paid online completely, I hope they add to or modify the incentives sooner rather than later. At the end of the day though, I think I'll still end up getting the online membership once the trial is up simply because, well, yeah. Games like Splatoon and Mario Kart thrive on online multiplayer. I hope there's still local multiplayer modes and in Splatoon 2's case a better local multiplayer mode, but I still really want to race and battle my friends online. I'm gonna miss Nintendo's free online service, but hey, if this leads to better online in the long run, I guess I can cope with it. And the number one worst aspect to the Nintendo Switch conference is... Okay. 
This may be slightly outside the scope of the presentation itself, but what's the point of having a console you're excited for if you're not able to get one? Availability for the Switch has been about as good as you might come to expect from Nintendo at this point. It's really not good at all. Getting the games I want hasn't been all that terrible, I've been able to pre-order Sonic Mania and Super Bomberman R without any troubles, but the console itself? Yikes, that thing sold out of its initial pre-order quantity really fucking quickly on all the websites it was available on, and now you're telling me GameStop's canceling random pre-orders? Yeesh. Stocking is something I think Nintendo can greatly improve on, especially considering the whole NES Classic Edition situation. It comes off as rather anti-consumer, but at the same time I can kind of understand it when you think about the work that goes into making these consoles. It's still bogus, but at least there's a tiny bit of a reason. The other aspect I wanted to talk about is these controller prices. Hot damn, these... these aren't cheap. 70 bucks for a Pro Controller? 80 bucks for a set of two Joy-Cons? Really? Now, Nintendo could be selling these at a loss, especially considering what happened with the Wii U and all, but at the same time, let's go back to my last point. I think having a large amount of stock available would both help Nintendo's profits, boost sales, and make consumers and fans alike happier in the long run. And I think selling these controllers at a lower price point would probably help too. Like, 30 bucks for the Joy-Con stand that actually charges the controllers? Seriously? It's not even included with the console? Sheesh. And now, let's talk about the best of the conference, the parts that made me wetter than an ice-cold glass of Pepsi. What, I got no other jokes, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Number 5 BEST! This is something that I think is going to impact other people a lot more than me. I'm not that big on importing games, in fact the only imports in my collection are really just Kirby's Dream Land 3 and Pokemon Yellow. I have nothing against the practice, like, at all, I just haven't dabbled into it much myself. However, for those that do import, doing away with region locking is going to be a huge plus for them. No longer will people have to import the console alongside the game just to play it. Now you can play games from any region on any system, and that's a wonderful plus to have. Number 4 BEST Hudson Soft went defunct in 2012, leaving most of its franchises in jeopardy at the hands of Konami. However, even knowing Konami nowadays, they decided to do something that nobody expected them to do and bring back everybody's favorite, White Bomber. It's Super Bomberman R. The only two things I'm a bit cautious about are the price and the potential Konami moves the game could make. Full price seems a bit steep for the kind of game this is. It could be well worth it, but I think a price point like 40 bucks would have been better for the kind of game this is, similarly to how Sega approached the Sonic All-Stars racing games. In regards to the potential Konami moves, well, my buddy Abby tweeted out an in-game screenshot that he called might be a sign of microtransactions. While I hope to god this isn't the case, even though unfortunately I do see it being possible, I'm still gonna buy the game. It's Bomberman, and seeing Konami do something I'm sure fans will appreciate for once is pleasantly surprising. What else can I say? Bomberman is back, baby, and I couldn't be happier. Number 3 BEST Here's probably the biggest surprise of the entire presentation. A new Nintendo IP simply known as... ARMS. It has an incredibly stupid title, but who cares? The game looks really fun, and the mechanic of using different kinds of long-ranged attacks looks like it could be a really strategic and inventive game. And hey, you don't even need to be concerned about the motion controls because thankfully they're optional. Plus, how can you say no to this adorable lolly? My biggest hope for the game is that they add in some guest fighters from other Nintendo franchises. Little Mac is probably the obvious choice, and even if he's not specifically from a Nintendo franchise, I'm sure a certain someone would enjoy some time in the arms ring. Number 2 BEST Aside from Breath of the Wild and the new Mario footage, which, trust me, we'll get to soon enough, two of the most striking things you'll notice in the Switch reveal trailer are the Mario Kart and Splatoon footage they showed off. Fortunately, both of these were formally announced at the event as Splatoon 2 and Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, alongside a host of other sequels and ports. And knowing Nintendo, most all of these look absolutely fantastic. I mentioned in my thoughts on video that I thought that with the unique hardware, ports on the Switch would probably be worth buying again, and Deluxe makes me stick to that opinion. Not only will it have the added bonus of playing local multiplayer on the go with the Switch and the Joy-Cons, but with the addition of a proper battle mode experience and new and returning characters like the Inklings, King Boo, and Bowser Jr., I think it's pretty safe that this will be the ultimate Mario Kart experience. 
But yeah, Nintendo, you should also do a proper Mario Kart 9 sometime down the line. That'd be sweet too. Same goes for Splatoon 2. While it's a sequel, not a port, it hits all the right notes in the same way Deluxe does. Gameplay-wise, 2 doesn't look all that different from the original Splatoon, but hey, Splatoon was an absolute blast. I think if it builds on the foundation of the original game while tweaking things in all the right ways, we could get an absolutely fresh Squidtastic sequel. I'm sorry. The other sequels and ports they announced we don't know all that much about, but they still look just as promising. Xenoblade 2, Project Sonic 2017, and especially Sonic Mania is finally coming to a Nintendo console, and Puyo Puyo Tetris is heading west. Heck, from the minute they showed of it, Fire Emblem Warriors looks really cool too, and I'm looking forward to whatever the devs have in store for the game later down the line. And the number one best aspect to the Nintendo Switch conference was... Oh yeah, you all saw this coming. Super Mario Odyssey and Zelda Breath of the Wild both look absolutely fantastic thus far. You might be thinking to yourself, well Justin, why didn't you group these with number two? They're both sequels. I don't know. Yes, they're also sequels, but they both kind of feel like they usher in a new era for both of these beloved franchises. Admittedly, I'm not the biggest Zelda fan in the world, but I can appreciate Breath of the Wild for just being a progressive game in the series overall while still staying true to what Zelda is as a franchise. And oh my god, Mario Odyssey is the game that really got me hyped. It looks inventive, colorful, gorgeous, it just looks like it's going to be a really fun inventive game to experience. In addition, both games are taking a more open world approach. I'm not that big into open world sandbox style games, I prefer linearity personally. Either way, both games look like great additions to Nintendo's catalog and I'm sure I'll have a lot of fun with both of them. There's definitely a release gap between the two, but hey, it's two great looking games within the Switch's first year and I'm sure they'll both be worth the wait. Now Nintendo. All we have is one question left. Where the fuck is Animal Crossing Switch? Hey guys, thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video, and hopefully I'll make more videos in the future in this style. Hopefully. School fucking sucks. In the meantime, why not check out some of my other videos? They're good, I think. Anyways, peace.